Good afternoon, everybody. It is Wednesday, November 18th, and you're here at Lunch and Learn. We're going to keep everybody muted uh, this morning. Uh, Dr. Turner is our guest speaker. You can hopefully see his initial slide. Um, and then about 10 minutes to the hour, we'll open up for uh, questions and answers. Uh, so we, this will be recorded for people who ask about that. We always record guest speakers. Um, just a brief intro. I, I think it was probably back in 2010 or so that I first met uh, uh, Dr. Turner, uh, Rusty. Um, it was at, a, I think it was a SEVA conference uh, that was one of the smaller you know, conferences on EEG and neurofeedback down in Charleston. And I was sitting at the table right next to the podium and he has a great sense of humor. And we started chit chatting and that was the beginning of, of our relationship that's gone on to this day. Uh, Dr. Turner has been uh, a pretty extensive background as you as you read in the announcements. He uh, is still uh, t working with uh, the Medical University of South Carolina in neurology. Uh, he consults, if anybody is ever looking to have a, a consult with a neurologist who understands and does neurofeedback, he'd be your guy. So Rusty, without any further uh, ado, I'm going to go ahead and uh, have you take over and Thanks so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thanks very much. I'm gonna, again, please speak up if I get. Thank, thanks for, very much for letting me be here, Rob and Richard and Judy and Martin and everybody. We'll move through. Uh, and I, my biggest criticism I usually get is I have too much information on slides. I don't do well talking from a few words, so all the, those slides can be overwhelming but they'll be available. I have some handouts I'll make available at the end and we'll go from there. And I welcome relatively gentle constructive criticism whenever that's available. Now let's see if I can make my slides work. Okay, click and one minute. So no disclosures, no commercial interests. The premise of my practice this talk is healthy lifestyle changes for our clients or patients, depending what you call people, will improve response to neurofeedback and neuromodulation. This is not a neurofeedback or neuromodulation talk, but what we can do before that and while we're doing neurofeedback with our clients. And I think I'm preaching to the choir that um, that's what's happening in this group all over the world. I won't read these in detail. We'll cover each one individually, but I have four objectives. I, some years ago, started using an acronym. Maybe it was a little passive aggressive rebellion or something as a physician because we prescribe a lot of meds, so we, we tend to do that. So I started prescribing meds, M, move, E, eat, D, disconnect, S, sleep. So that's the bulk of this talk with some science behind it and some case presentations that we'll talk about and hopefully get it all in a reasonable amount of time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So welcome from Charleston, South Carolina. It's a beautiful day here. I quickly will not go through every face on these slides, but I always start every talk I give as I start every morning with a whole lot of gratitude for being alive and for people that have influenced my life. I don't know if my mouse shows on the screen. It does. does. It does. Okay. I will. I will not try to be one of those moving the mouse all over. But so many people have shaped my career, um, both in my research, in my studies, and research as a musician, as an epileptologist. Um, these are colleagues on either side: Jim Evans and colleagues here in South Carolina, Dick Gennardi's. Also, one that's been a part of my career, like Rob and Richard, if now lives in South Carolina. Um, just other people, faces you'll remember where my, I call it my wake up from the matrix experience began back for almost eight, nine years ago at a conference that Barry was at and Joel and Cindy Kirsten, Phil Lubar, Jay Gunkelman, and that began. A, radical transformation of my career or expansion of my career. So I'm grateful to many, many people who have been shaping my life, including 
my wife of 40 years, our incredible family, and I will take the next 15 minutes to tell you all about my grandkids. No, I won't do that. So also grateful to the, the physicians that trained me. This is not meant to be a gender bias slide. These happen to be the kids neurologists and epileptologists that shaped my career dramatically. You'll recognize Dr. Niedermeyer, at least his name, and some of these amazing EEG people, and mostly from the patients and families that have continued to shape my life. So quick quote from Tom Insel, who was director of the National Institutes of Mental Health until 2015, tremendous scientist. It's time for us to stop thinking about mental disorders and start understanding them as brain disorders. And my motto has been, we need to be focusing as clinicians on restoration of brain and lifestyle of health instead of just what I call disease management. As it, this has always been at the core of true medicine, and I think that has been the historical precedent that we're trying to continue. And again, I know that's the mindset that all of you are approaching. Let's be healthcare providers and not just prescribers and things like that. So I have some pause slides throughout where we can take a short breath, at least I will, so I don't stay too nervous and ramble, but that's Monet, one of my favorite artists. A foundation thing that I, I work with, there's a principle, which is a bar against all information, which is proof against all arguments, and which cannot fail to keep a person in everlasting ignorance. That principle is contempt prior to investigation. And that it seems to be a human trait that I've been guilty of and many of us are guilty of. We see that when we try to explain the feedback when it's evidence-based to colleagues or to others in the world and you get that, oh, that's sweet, or oh, you know, you know what you hear. I was credited to a person, Herbert Spencer, in the late 1800s. It was now made famous in the 1940s when it was included in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, but it was actually a revision of a quote from 1850 by Dr. Paley. That's another story. I love a few other quotes here. It is interesting and indeed pathetic to observe how long the discovery of priceless value to humanity may be hidden away or rather lie openly revealed before the final and obvious step is taken for its practical application. That was spoken about the opposition at that point to using anesthesia in surgery. We look at that now and go, you're kidding, that's ridiculous, but when, why? How many times have you have clinicians been asked by your clients and your families, this is so valuable and it changes. Why is the world not using it? Why is it not more widespread? And that's a good question that we have to just keep helping our patients. Based on a thorough review of many decades of peer reviewed literature, increasing contributions from connectomics and brain computer interface science, our understanding of human disease and of human health have undergone profound paradigm shifts. So we know our nervous systems are probably the most complex network known in the universe. And clinical disorders, which really result from dysregulation of these networks, in some ways, are among the most disabling and therapeutically intractable global health problems. And therefore, not surprising that understanding and recording brain network connectivity has long been a central goal of neuroscience and continues to catalyze an unprecedented era of large scale initiatives and collaborative projects to map brain networks more comprehensively and in greater detail than ever before. So that's a bit of the background, another pause, and that's what you're doing here. That's what's happening with New Mind that Richard has been building for decades, and we see how a simple tool, or well, a complex tool can be simply used to open up the world of what's going on in the brains and nervous systems of our patients and clients. And again, the objectives, I'll break these down individually as we go through them. I'll keep an eye on the time. So a couple of things. These are my definitions, not that they're right, but you can detect the bias in them. And again, I think we're all coming from the same mindset, the same basis. So quickly, <clears throat> excuse me, neuroplasticity, neuromodulation, neurofeedback, and then we'll get to the meds. 
Neuroplasticity is the brain's lifelong ability to grow, heal, and change. Neuroplasticity occurs, it's not just neuronal, it's synaptic, it's myelin, it's absolutely astounding. And I like to put this statement in other medical meetings, the fact of neuroplasticity has replaced the formally held opinion that the brain doesn't change. I wish it was a formally held opinion universally. I think often we, we maybe in my profession give vocal support to that. Yes, the brain has neuroplasticity, but we don't treat our patients that way. We put them on a medication and say, here's your antidepressant. That's the way it's going to be. Sorry, you're going to be off the rest of your life. That's the way it is. And we know that's not true. So the motto of what I've adopted is health, hope, and healing. I think we can all echo with that. And then to bring to our patients and our clients the hope, it's never too late. Because most people don't come to see us when we're having a nice day. And at least in my practice, people would be seen over and over. Multiple second opinions, third opinions, and they would come kind of as a last resort. I'm not going to go into detail and to neuroplasticity, but we know it's there. What's amazing is one of the seminal, seminal articles was published in 1998. Here we are 22, 23 years later, and here we are. But the key things in this article, self-renewal occurs throughout life. Neurogenesis continue, continues throughout life. Newly discovered type of neuroplasticity responds to regional cues, hence the amazing things we can do with neurofeedback and neuromodulation and lifestyle. And environmental stimulation can influence the rate of neurogenesis. We have the potential, really, we see that, to regulate human neurogenesis. That's what we're trying to do, in a sense, every day in our practices. This article was another seminal article. I love the human structural plasticity at record speed. It's amazing how quickly things can happen. We see that again in our practices, how quickly that can happen and yet others sometimes how slow it can be. And the other aspect that you'll hear people bring up sometimes is, well, it's my genetics, I can't change. I've got a genetic uh, mutation, I've got a genetic disease, and then we think that means we can't change. That's not true. Uh, again, a very seminal article published, I think this was, two, yeah, 2008, my own slide, uh, where they did lifestyle changes on a group of gentlemen with prostate cancer, and they chose lifestyle intervention, interventions, they did serial biopsies, and they upregulated health-promoting genes and downregulated 453 disease-promoting genes, and it's a, we can change our genetics by making simple changes. We know we can harm our genetics with radiation and things like that. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Neuromodulation, a broad definition, reinforcing brain function for increased stability and efficiency of information processing and networks linked to symptoms. So we're trying to link symptoms to brain dysregulation. Again, this is what we do in our practices and you all get that, just setting up the foundation. I use terms a little bit differently. I talk about invasive and non-invasive differently when, when as a neurologist and epileptologist, when we talk about invasive, we're sticking things into the head or the neurosurgeons are, like vagus nerve stimulation, responsive neural stimulation, when we form a limited form of helping people with seizures, deep brain stimulation. Generally, don't do that on a daily basis and in practice. So we have all kinds of amazing ways of non-invasive neural stimulation. And why not first do no harm? Let's start with the good stuff that can help people. So I talk about active or invasive neuromodulation. Those things where we're introducing a current or something into the brain, photobiomodulation, um, hemoencephalography, electromagnetic lens, things like that along the spectrum. And then non-invasive, the things that we do that really change the perspective of my practice dramatically, like neurofeedback, biofeedback, heart rate variability, and onward. Neurofeedback, again, my definition, certainly subject to discussion, it's a non-invasive form of neuromodulation that enables a person to self-regulate their brain activity. 
we know that's possible, even though we have many skeptics that still doubt that, despite the work that that the Camilla did, Dr. Sturman, and many others, even before that, after the time of Dr. Berger, and even before the discovery of the EEG. This is accomplished through the use of real time brain computer interface and the learning theory technique of optimal or operant conditioning, and teaches or trains the brain to better self regulate. So, probably like you do, I would describe that very much as exercise for the brain. It's pretty easy to do. The goal of clinical care. And there are feedback training like physical exercises to help restore, normalize, and optimize brain function and health. So a little pause. Same slide. This is Morning on the Sen by Monet. So here's the four meds. Movie, disconnect, sleep. And I will break down each of the objectives, try to keep it simple as we move through each section. When I was working with families, I felt like the last eight years, I was acting more like a health coach than a physician, trying to be a health provider and prescribing a lot of times what I thought was just common sense. I would call it grammar wisdom. Guess what? We should eat. We should move around. We should eat healthier. We should build relationships instead of electronicize them. I don't know if that's a word I just made up. And sleep. I would say enjoying recreation, healthy replenishing building relationships, prioritizing rest, thus giving us exercise, healthy eating, engaging and in a whole new way as we have to do it more and more now through just through the, the whole media and Zoom and things like that. But there's ways to do it very well and very healthily and energized. This was my busy slide I would show to people trying to give them one point, move, we're supposed to move 60 minutes a day eat real food, hydrate, try to stay away from what we have so much of, food products, disconnecting, uh, go over those recommendations. How many are spending one hour a day on electronics? Raise your hand. I um, don't have any cameras, so I can't see you all, but I don't think any of us are. So how do we do this safely? And then sleep. How are we getting enough sleep? Are we getting enough good sleep? And I think not only is disconnecting the whole digital concern, one of the pandemics that's bringing on so much disease, but the epidemic pandemic of, of in chronic inadequacy, it's a problem. So let's start with move. Move to understand the importance of daily exercise and movement to brain and body physiologic health. It's more than just moving our bodies, it's keeping our brains moving and active, and we don't have to take up marathon training. Um, standing is important, so I'll talk about a few of those things as we touch on the moving. Detailed slides, I won't go through every word on many of these slides, but the, I'll have handouts to have access to these resources. Many of you already know this, but for many, many years, the American Academy of Pediatrics, among other organizations, has said at least 60 minutes of movement and exercise a day from the age of five, kindergarten on up. How often is that happening? Even now in the COVID pandemic, as we're inside, we're afraid to go outside, we're on our electronics. We're not getting up. Go outside, take a walk, get some sunlight. Um, makes a difference. Again, 60 minutes a day. And for kids, incorporate it into what they love, active play. So the more we like doing something, the more likely we are to keep doing it. And it doesn't have to be continuous. Uh, it can be broken down into blocks of time. And that has a cumulative effect. We know that that's why we're supposed to take standing breaks and stretch breaks and screen breaks through the day. And there's devices you can do to alert yourself to that. And if we're not active as adults, our children are not active, just start from where we are. A lot of the stuff we tell families is overwhelming, but take some small steps. I want to throw in a little bit on at least my understanding of vitamin D and what I also consider one of the big epidemics, if not a pandemic of vitamin D deficiency. And from the dermatologic societies, 15 to 20 minutes of good, healthy sun exposure without sunscreen 
between 10 in the morning and two in the afternoon. And the sun's so bad. Three to five times a week leads to up to 10 to 20,000 of international units of vitamin D naturally. That's the best thing we can get. So get outside, keep the windows open, things like that. Supplements are good, but our bodies are so designed and created to produce what we need, the vitamins, the neurochemicals. And again, you all know that. I won't go into the radiation, um, what's best when we talk about the UVB, the UVA, but I will talk about visible light in just a little bit in a different context. So that's just my throwing it in. Get outside. It's crucial for optimal health and disease prevention. So we know as clinicians, I'm proverbial preaching to the choir again. Exercise helps us, it makes us happier, it makes us feel better, it's good for our entire systems, it's not just for our hearts. And this is not new. Uh, I still would challenge people when we get that excuse that show me the randomized double blinded studies, why neurofeedback work. I say, show me a randomized double blinded placebo controlled study that exercise works. I don't think that's possible the way randomized double blind placebo studies were designed for to bring pharmaceuticals to market and things like that. So we know, get outside 20 minutes. This was from the work in Toronto about 10 years ago. Get outside, walk, it helps. It makes us healthier. It helps mitigate symptoms of depression. Very busy slide, but this is in the literature. It's evidence-based. It's funny, we don't have to convince people. You don't get the same skepticism like, well, I don't think I should exercise. It's there, but it's not just moving. It's also looking at the dangers of our sedentary behavior. And Eric Pepper did a wonderful, has done some wonderful work presenting this, but uh, the sitting disease was started to be described, I think, in 2010, 2011. But it's far more than just our posture. It's what it's doing to our entire systems. We probably may have heard the sitting is the new smoking logo. It's a problem. So get up, stand up, move. I have a standing desk. I try to move around. I try to be standing uh, without bouncing too much. The numbers aren't good. We know the numbers. Get up and move. John Raddy, phenomenal physician. I have a link in one of the handouts for um, some of his work. But get up and move, exercise. Spark, Bill Wild, a couple of books that he has uh, produced. He's got wonderful presentations that I would encourage families to look at. Educators, I've done some presentations here for our Charleston County Schools. And exercise is the single most powerful tool we have to optimize our brain function. That's from Dr. Reddy. Dr. Reddy's work. I I don't know if it's the single most, but it sure is important in the school system where I don't know. I, my hat is completely off to teachers trying to do what they're doing now in this new COVID world. I don't and it's just it's absolutely amazing how you do it. And I don't think they gauge for PE, but hopefully we don't lose that and get sicker and sicker as a society. More detail, it's there. It's good for education. It would break my heart when I would hear more and more about schools that have to cut PE or limit PE. They're just not moving around. So what can we do? I will make available if anybody's interested. I have four handouts that I use, each of the MEDS, and I won't go through these now, but they basically break down I would use them as education, give them to families. Here's what we need to learn about. Here's the changes you can make. Here's some links. I'm not just the crazy one saying this. It's been talked about for a long time. I would talk a lot about the importance of posture, avoiding eye neck, eye hunch, all these things. Just start with small steps and small goals. It's amazing how that builds up. So a little pause and let's move on to E for eating. Objective, understanding the basic principles of our enteric nervous system, the so-called brain-gut connection, or brain-gut health, 
and how to implement simple daily nutrition habits to improve brain and physiologic health. Remember, this is coming from me in a neurology practice. I'm not an exercise physiologist. I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a, well, I'm trained in sleep, but I'm not a sleep physician. I'm trying, we were, we were triaging. We were trying to help people begin to make changes. So with this, I talk about what we're drinking, what we're eating, and what we're thinking. And those are all important. Basically, anything that comes in through our senses, through our mouth, our nose, our eyes, our ears, is influencing what's going on in our nervous systems. Thomas Edison was quoted as saying, the doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest his patients in the care of human frame, in diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. Again, without going in depth in the literature, we know now the growing understanding how many of our current, particularly chronic diseases, are immune based, and many of those are based in the gut. If we don't change the gut, we can do all the feedback we want, and we're working uphill. We have to have that whole approach, as we know, to our clients and to our patients. Um, it is called, there's a couple journals, Neurogastroenterology. I've seen a trend over the last few years to call it the gut brain connection. I took personal offense to that. Uh, not really, but I always thought the brain was first, but if you're sick and your gut's not feeling well, it, it overrules what's going on in your brain. Again, not new. This is looked at at the NIMH and many other places. Eight million people die, probably more than that, from mental ill health, mental illness. Many of these cases have obvious reasons, but deaths, uh, other deaths are due to acute and chronic comorbid conditions, lifestyle related, cardiovascular and GI problems, metabolic disorder, they see that. So if we are, as physicians, are simply prescribing medications and we're not dealing with the rest of the, I tell somebody to get lung therapy, uh, pulmonary therapy, but don't tell them to quit smoking, what are we doing? That's not being a healthcare provider. We know the importance, what our grandmas told us, you are what you eat, no, big deal, we know that. Visceral influences on behavior, literature is so full of this, it just continued to amaze me. I like to throw in the work of a colleague who was here in South Carolina, psychiatrist, that they must face the possibility as mental health providers that medications we prescribe may hurt more than they help. I think, again, talking to an audience that realizes that. Most of the time, our patients realize that, our, our clients, when we experience side effects. Many studies looking at that, even just basic anticholinergic medications. This came out in JAMA Neurology 2016, an overwhelming table of meds that can affect what's going on with long-term cognition. This was looking at long-term cognitive effects of a lot of things that are now over the counter and just helping our, our clients, our families, our patients to realize how can we help our endogenous neuropharmacy produce what it needs to. Um, and again, just another thing that I would love help and, and constructive criticism if you have it, that I, I would frequently talk to families about serotonin SSRIs the serotonergic type of medications, and then ask them, we were using those to treat psychology and psychic depression, anxiety, things like that. But where's most of the serotonin to do? As a leading question, we would say brain. Well, no, my understanding, at least of the current literature, is probably 90, 95% is produced in the gut. So we're definitely working up health. So, uh, two quick examples on eating, and I'll have some more maps. These are from NeuroGuide, so it's not in the new mind format. We have run a lot of this, but I haven't put together a new presentation on the comparison. But this is a young man early in my practice that I saw, 2014, 2015, that came diagnosed with seizures, autism spectrum disorder, and was very aggressive. Went through many evaluations basically significantly high relative power, 
kind of across the bandwidth, particularly in the higher frequencies. We also saw it more in the eyes closed. So this, there's some trauma history and some other things with this young man. I interpreted, particularly in the one hertz bin, when I see significant low power, that to me is a sign of chronic inadequate sleep, particularly slow wave sleep, because we're not getting our brain renewed. So we had a lot. With all the family, they couldn't do more feedback, even with Medicaid, couldn't fit in the schedule. But to this mom's credit, she went with these kids, with this little guy in particular, and went gluten free. Six, eight months later, we did another study and I crossed out. It's, it, I, I have some incredibly dramatic, dramatic responses in my practice, but seizures, he did not have what they thought were seizures. His EEG improved. His autism spectrum was gone. This was a different kid. I wish everybody responded this dramatically to gluten over nutritional interventions, but it was dramatic. And if I look at the changes that we could see in the functional mapping from before till after, that correlated. He even helped it, it improve his background frequency to a very robust 9 hertz, 9.5 hertz. It was amazing. He still had significant sleep dysregulation. He still had a lot to work on. But just a change. That was pretty amazing. On the eating. I have also a handout that I'll make available if anybody wants it, where I talk about hydration, nutrition, try to put some pretty pictures, just recommend what people can think about eliminating and what we're doing to tell ourselves. And simple things, the, the rainbow of colors of fruits and vegetables that we can be eating, staying away from that acronym, standard and modern American diet, eating real food, learning more about the brain about connection i just make a few recommendations and the importance of our healthy thinking i'll talk about some recommendations in a little bit including a recent documentary some of you may have seen called the social dilemma uh, deals more with the next topic so a little pause so i'm doing on time a little behind so i will have to pick up so disconnecting, this is where I spend so much of the time with families. What do I mean by that? Understanding the great basic principles of digital health by living a healthy lifestyle of responsible high-tech and screen use and the awareness of the risks of pervasive EMF, electromagnetic frequency exposure. Big deal. I think this is one of the uh, largely ignored huge factors that affecting us, is affecting us worldwide. And I'll, I break it down into three things. The time exposure, HEV, high energy visible light exposure, screens, small screens, phones, big screens, TVs, things like that, and EMF exposure. So again, you can find these links, go to the American Academy of Pediatrics. He recommended these things for a long time, limit, optional screen use to one hour a day. I don't think I have it here, but I have ASMD. So they would break it down. They've been doing this for years. Under the age two, for the age of two, no screen use. They do throw in there for grandparents like myself, occasional FaceTime or Zoom or whatever with grandkids is, is good, but no screens under age two. I think we've got a problem. This year. Two to five years, one hour per day, of high quality programs. Instead, their radical recommendation is we should be playing with our kids and doing other things than just letting them be on screens. Um, maybe that was disrespectful for putting them to death. Greater than six years, consistent limits, limit optional screen time. I put that optional in, that's not in the AAP recommendations because so much of what we're doing now on screens, and I'll talk about some screen safety ideas limit the types of media again common sense in practice these are the recommendations how are we doing it well not very well i think and let's build relationships we all know the excuses we think we're having all of these friends on facebook or something and we're not really connected a couple of good documentaries this came out quite a few years ago now but screen agers we know that we talk about the time on screens this is a I think a superb, very well done in research documentary. 
on Netflix, probably other ways you can get it. It should be free. Um, there's the website for that. Much bigger than just social media. It's a it's a big changing world, and we've let uh, the Pandora's box is um, is out there. I would use this slide with some families not to overwhelm, but way back in 2011, the World Health Organization classified smart boards as two B possible carcinogens. Why would they say these crazy things? It's almost 10 years ago this research has been made. Microwave radiation. So we'll go on to that in just a minute, talking about EMF effects. Dan Siegel, phenomenal clinician, scientist, speaker, writer, researcher, talked about smartphones before bed. We've been talking about this for years. I have some recommendations on that and why that's a problem and the evidence of how it's affecting sleep or a whole lot of other things. Mari Swingle uh, published a wonderful work on eye mind, dealing with screen addictions and other things. She came out with a second edition a couple of years ago, um, two years ago. Anyway, HEV, high energy visible light exposure. What do I mean by that? I still use the term LED light emitting devices. HEV is the high energy visible light that comes from every screen that, that emits light, TVs, any screen you look at, basically. It's not the invisible light that comes from the sun, but this is part of the problem. We call it the blue light effect. It's really not blue, it's more violet or ultraviolet, but that's splitting, splitting hairs on the issue. We, some of us may remember these days, some of us are still trying to have some of these days. This is called a book. This is what we used to use in the last century when people would read. And using light. So in the 1920s, from my high-tech research on Wikipedia and others, the electric television was invented in the 20s by uh, Dr. Farnsworth. A fundamental change to me occurred at that point. We had always used light for illumination of what we were looking at or looking for. We heard innumerable warnings. How many of us heard that growing up? Don't ever look at the sun. Don't sit too close to the TV. Move back from the TV. Or my favorite in the movies today, don't do that. Well, we changed that and we started staring at screens. Obviously, the TV of the 1920s and 30s is nothing compared to the luminescence and intensity coming from screens today. And these are real pictures. If any of you get time, go back to 2008. Wally, either, if you remember that movie, came out. It's very scary and it's prophetic where we're at now, pretty amazing. Um, and we see these scenes all the time, but we started looking at light and our systems aren't made to stare at light. And that started a, now I think a pandemic of complex disorders worldwide. And it's not just humans, but we'll talk a little bit about that in the EMF. So when we talk about blue light, many of you have seen this visible light is basically this 400 to 800 nanometers in most screens. Part of that blue we call the harmful blue. We've known for a long time the evidence from the optometrists, from the ophthalmologists, this is hurting our eyes. It's hurting the cornea, the lens, the retina. To me, where is light processed in the brain? So this is changing our brains. So the screen filters like the glasses, which are in bucks on Amazon, the blue light glasses, the screen filter like F. Lux for your computer, filter out 50 nanometers. That's the high, high wavelength, short wavelength, high energy that's causing the damage. We need light, it's good, but we're staring too much. Unfortunately, I think when uh, Apple, for example, came out, I think in 2017 with uh, Night Shift, they took their technology from a company called F. Lux. But they called it night shift, and it says on your phone, turn it on it, turn it on at night so you get a better night's sleep. Well, if we're staring at screens all day, we're getting the HEV, the high energy visible light that's causing its problem. And it penetrates just like other lights. So I won't even get into the skin studies at this point, but it affects our melatonin as well. And if you wait until nighttime to turn it on, 
is still affecting our melatonin. So what I saw clinically, and I'll show you a few maps on that, is that it affected particularly the early sleep where we get the most deep sleep. This is still using the stage one through four classification, but I saw evidence over and over and over of deficits, damage going on in the deep sleep. F.Lux, if you haven't heard of it, get it, find it, put it on your devices. It's free, it's easy to use. It filters out that 50 nanometers of the harmful blue. It does turn your screen a little bit yellow. Get used to it. So the sunglasses, that's the way it is. And you can adjust it very easily on the screen. I won't show that to you now. Apple put it on at night shift. I think other organizations, other devices call it blue shade, things like that. So it's important. It's making a difference. It's changing our brains. And I'll show you some of those in the slide in the map. So Rusty, it's about a quarter till, about five minutes, you'll have, uh, it'd be 10 to the hour. Okay, I probably will go, um, let me go another probably eight minutes. Yeah, okay, yep, I want perfect, to go 10, but we'll do. I'll do that. Mm -hmm. Let me hit on EMF, I'll talk about sleep, and then I'll just show what I see in a few cases and then we'll move on. So yeah, thank you, Rob. EMF. Electromagnetic frequencies, this I took off the internet. It's quoted from some website, it's old. But I would use this slide over and over. So how are we affected? We've talked about the amount of screen time, we've talked about blue light, but how are we affected by EMF, so-called microwaves? And I would look at this slide. I had the privilege of working with two NASA scientists that came to my practice in the last couple of years before it closed. And um, ask them, challenge me, show me where I'm wrong. And I would ask kids, are you supposed to stick your head in a microwave? Duh. No. Well, if you look at the radio frequency of microwave ovens and you look at wireless devices, which are usually in the centers of our homes or our phones with increasing bandwidth, you don't stick your head in a microwave. Why should we be putting these things on our head or near our bodies or near where we sleep? So I have recommendations. So I would start there as a framework. We know the research has been going on for a long time about EMF fields. We know for a long time we've been influencing the migratory patterns of animals worldwide um, and because of EMF pollution and other things, but EMF in particular affecting their navigation devices. And I don't know any birds that have their cell phones with them or bears that have wireless in their dens, but you know, there might be um, smart meters, a whole nother discussion, EMF radiation. I'm still looking for the original source of these, but you can measure absorption rate of a phone on a head and a five-year-old, 10-year-old, and adult brain. It penetrates, get the phones off your head. Every single phone today, including Apple and other companies, when you do your upgrades, it's in the small print that you never read. It says, do not carry the phone on your head. Carry it at least a centimeter away from our body. It's in there, we sign it, we agree to it every time we update our phones, but we don't practice that. Or then we go wireless, we put in our AirPods or some other uh, device, and that's still an electronically transmitting receiving device. So we can measure those effects. I have links to a couple really good websites in the handouts if you're interested that have this effect. And over and over, I was seeing more symptoms like this in many of my patients. That doesn't mean it was exclusively due to EMF or wireless effects, but it was a big deal. And what was more dramatic is the changes I would see in people as they would say, hmm, maybe the ringing is due to that, and start looking for the source of the problem because it's affecting all of us. It's not new. Back in the 70s, the Navy was discovering radio wave sickness and all its systemic effects and a few symptoms that may be manifest of EMF illness. It's there, it's affecting us. So at least why not look at things we can do? There's tremendous websites, Environmental Health Trust, Parents for Safe Technology, and these will be in the handouts, but do your homework if you haven't looked at these already. Physicians for Safe Technology, Wi-Fi in schools. It's been shown for, I don't know how many countries now have removed Wi-Fi in schools. That started in, in earlier, I think 2012 or 13, some of the earlier countries. Cyprus did it in 2017. So why are they doing that? Why are they not putting wireless in? Let's figure that out. Wireless education, really good resource website. So 
Another thing that I started seeing, and Rob, I'm hoping maybe five to seven minutes and then some time for questions or lunch. I, You're good. I started using a term, I called it brain burn. My, my crazy mind, if you go out in the sun and you're out there too long, what happens? You get sunburned. If you're in front of a light emitting source, you can get, quote, brain burn. Not truly really brain burn. I uh, haven't looked at a autopsy brain to see if it turns red. I don't think so. But I saw this in the maps over and over. So I'm going to come back to brain burn in just a minute. Again, a handout I use for digitally disconnecting talks about the time element, which is important, but that's just a part of it. I talk about the high energy visible light and what people can do free or cheaply to protect our eyes just as much as we should wear sunglasses outside. I think we should be wearing screen glasses when we're on a screen to minimize the, EMF, uh, the, the blue light effect. Uh, tech problems, what we're seeing worldwide, the pandemic, and I'm using that term deliberately, of neurological, developmental, mental ill health issues, systemic illnesses, it's affecting us all. And many times I found that was the hindrance it wasn't being addressed when somebody wasn't responding like I was hoping or thought they should with neurofeedback. EMF pollution, um, different terms are used. It's there. These are some phenomenal websites. Again, I referred to them in the earlier slides. So do your homework and test and see. Finally, on sleep, understand the basic principles of sleep, sleep dysregulation, and the impact of unhealthy and inadequate sleep. Simple implementation measures can improve the quality of sleep and the brain, our brain and body physiologic health. I was amazed when families would take them seriously and would start to make these changes, how quickly it could help. And you hear Martin and others talk about this sleep, 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 and we're, we're doing it even worse now. I would talk about the epidemic or the pandemic of sleep, even drowsiness. You ever get drowsy when you're driving? Go hmm, figure. But it's not just sleepy, it's what it manifests neurologically, it's what it manifests systemically. It's a big problem. And this would begin to get people to realize, oh, it's not just how I sleep, it's how it's affecting the rest of my body. Uh, Kreiger and demand for big sleep, sleep people, healthful sleep has been empirically proven to be the single most important factor in predicting longevity, more important than diet, exercise, and validity. These terms are in the handout. I would try to get people to remember three numbers, five years, 10 years, really adult. Most kindergartners are supposed to be getting 12, 12 to 13 hours of healthy, distorted sleep every night. Look at our society, look at our schedules and see how that's not happening. If you need 12 hours of sleep in schools where they're not getting naps, then they need to be asleep at 7 p.m. to get up at 7 a.m. at the desk. The average 10 year old should be getting 10 hours of sleep. And again, everybody's different, but we tend to definitely underdo the sleep. And that's assuming good quality sleep. And adults, eight to nine hours. So I want to go through a few cases. This was sleep. This young man came to see me because of uh, ticks, was the main complaint. But he'd had a concussion four years before. His sleep was not good. This young man, unlike many, was not getting a lot of exposure to school. They didn't have smart boards in his particular school at that point. Didn't use computers at school, which was a pretty radical school, but there was other stuff going on. So we talked about sleep, we talked about EMF. He was having a lot of symptoms and problems. And then a marker I began to see in the EEG, eyes open, eyes closed. We normally see an enhancement. This is an occipital, the back part of the brain started seeing more and more and more of this in strong enhancement of this background, eye open to eye closed closure. What I saw in the maps often was, oh, I'll talk about the brain burn in a minute, but I would see this increasingly blue. We use a wide frequency from 0.3 to 70 Hertz on our bandwidth for our EEG. So we're not filtering out one Hertz. And so I would see this low power indicative to me of slow wave sleep, at least consistently that was showing up in the history. Then 
I would do a Laplacian transform to try to take out the medication effect. This young man was on clonidine and melatonin. So I was seeing more effects with the medication, but his brain was still experiencing chronic inadequate sleep from the way I interpreted the maps. Uh, switching, so he made changes, he made improvements. Here's another uh, little 10 year old girl. At that point, she came on multiple medications. The headache were a 10, it says migraine headaches. He was a second opinion. She was on four drugs at the time from other prescribers and did her maps. Sleep was an issue. She was having anxiety issues. It was EMF. We approached the lifestyle. She did not get neurofeedback. She came back four months later. And mom put zero. At first, I thought she made a mistake when we sat down. The headaches were gone by simply making lifestyle changes. I wish they were all this dramatic. And many are, but it was gone. Mom had to run on her own to take her the medications. And this little girl was headache free. This seven year old girl, same thing. She was on five at the time, had been on multiple medication, other medication trials. Mom rated it a six. When she came back, it was a zero. So I started seeing that more frequently. She had significant high power, uh, which I thought uh, that's part of the pattern I see with brain, what I call brain burn, based on the red, sleep issues. After making changes three months later, dramatic improvements in her headaches and other symptoms. It shouldn't be this easy. So again, with sleep, I have a handout. This information in this slide basically is in the handout of what I was telling people. I would help them understand how sleep is, just, is impacting us as humans, chronic inadequate sleep, every system that it affects, things we can do. Turning off the router at night is one of the biggest things. Don't just put your phone in airplane mode. Keep our devices away from where we sleep. Know where your smart meter is, learn about it, act accordingly, things like that as well as teaching relaxation breathing. And Rob, I'm doing it again. I'll take a couple yep, minutes. You're, uh, you're okay. sitting at three minutes to the hour. Pardon? Three minutes left uh, up to the hour. Oh, I mean, we can stay okay. a bit longer, but you're at you're three minutes to the hour. I can take questions by mail. <laughs> but this, I would see this pattern. This young man came for headaches and ADHD symptoms is what the complaints were. He was I often see this as an anxiety pattern, perhaps, because it would be high spectral power in the beta frequencies. But he was he was not anxious. He did not have anxiety. Again, I'm not a mental health provider and just diagnosing that, but it wasn't there. But he had this dramatic increase in the eyes closed compared to the eyes open, particularly in the posterior regions, his posterior dominant rhythm of 10 to 11 hertz. Here's another one, the same thing. I started seeing more of this. That's where I came up with this. What am I seeing? Is this brain burn? It's something you can see in your own practices if you're looking at the, the EEG, eyes open, eyes closed. And over and over and over, this pattern began to prove uh, not just for inattention, but anger, impulsivity, many symptoms. So I would make lifestyle changes and recommend this to people see these patterns. This kid had brain fog horribly. Um, oh, I'm sorry. This this is a 39-year-old that I saw shortly before we closed my practice. Brilliant man um, with anxiety and sleep issues. And he's got brain fog. He's tired. He's not doing well. And interestingly, he had neurofeedback and he improved. Okay, I don't have the follow-up slides. But when he came back, I started seeing asymmetry. This is the left side of the brain. This is the right side of the brain. But I started seeing asymmetry in some of his left temporal region, left temporal. And then he had these discharges, right frontal, right temporal. So he delved again because he was trying to use the glasses. He was trying to turn off his router at night. But then we realized his router was three feet to his right on his desk. And his phone, he was still using his phone too much on his head and using AirPods. So we talked about those things. So I think these were some signals coming just from his routine EEG. And again, I have a lot more of these that just kept this dramatic increase when I think people have too much EMF exposure, screen exposure. It's showing up in our brains. 
So again, I had another headache, got better, and I think I better be quiet about it. Uh, the hour has come to a close. The, the last yeah, Rusty, that's a uh, wonderful input you have. Uh, Rusty, I wonder if we can take a couple of minutes off for some interaction just because sure. you bring such a wealth of information and we're not going to have time to talk more with you in person. Sure. Let me congratulate you for your enormous uh, progress in the field of neurofeedback for a neurologist and how far you've come in incorporating new mind into your practice. Um, you're you're a wonderful example of the medical profession incorporating these other allied health and related fields into formal neurology. I wish we had more time for you to talk about your specific training in looking at the, like the raw data. Yeah. Maybe we can ask Rob to invite you back for some of that down the road. That would be fine. I will jump ahead like all terrible talkers that didn't ration their time well. And here's our conclusion. And it's just amazing what lifestyle can do to help people get better. And you know that. It's just having the evidence and being a healthcare provider. So thank you very much. Well, Rusty, we're at the top of the hour, and I know people uh, typically start to leave because they have patience and obligations. Would you want us to do one of two things? Find it another day where you can come back and just kind of have open discussion with us, or do you want I can have people email me all the questions and send them to you in a email, and you can respond to them all? Got a preference? Um, I think I, I, I like the, the interaction. We'll okay. You want to do that in meds part two or something without 160 okay. slides <laughs> into place? <laughs> Let's talk about it because it's, it's uh, okay. Well, it's, I'll it's tell you what, our patients. you and I'll talk after the webinar today. Well, um, uh, we can we, give me a call when you get on when you have a moment. I'm, I'm uh, kind of home all day today, okay. And um, and we'll just try to look at where you want to go from here because it'd be lovely to have you back. I mean, this is incredible information, it's one of the nicest presentations I've seen summarizing all these health issues we talk about here. Uh, I agree with Vic. This is this was incredible, and I want to thank you so much for your time. So, folks, I think what we'll do today is we're going to wrap it up. Um, I, I'll talk with Rusty. We'll come up with a plan. I'll put it out in the list serve in plenty of time for people to know. In the meantime, we'll get this posted on the New Mind YouTube channel. I know there's a lot to gather and go through. We'll get this posted as quickly as the team there can get it uh, done. And uh, Rusty, just again, thank you so much. Beautiful, beautiful uh, presentation. Just fact-filled, supported information. I don't know how to thank you other than to say you're the best. <laughs> thank you, Ron. Right. And I just, for other people, keep doing what you're doing, even if you get put down, if you don't have an MD degree. Most of us MDs aren't doing this. Keep providing the health care, helping people to change their lives. That's the last thing we're going to do. So keep up the good work. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much. Everybody, we'll see you Friday. Have a great uh, afternoon. Be safe out there. Thank you so much for attending. And thank you, Rob, for putting it together with Rusty. Uh, my pleasure. My honor. Bye, all. Bye -bye.